So this is a historical experiment that I want to just describe quickly because it's a actually useful setup to consider what's going on with this new reality of nature. So, but to be clear, um, so to be historically correct, uh, Einstein was not influenced by this experiment at all. So when you look up Einstein's work, his original work on special relativity is what he titled Electrodynamics of Moving Bodies. So he was actually um, interested, he, he was a theorist. So he was interested in it purely for, uh, from a theoretical point of view. But what this experiment is, is good for is for other doubters, other people who doubted that Einstein was correct in assuming that Maxwell was correct, another theorist, um, that this experiment proves for those other people that uh, Maxwell was correct and Einstein is also correct. So uh, we covered this when we did the optics. So I will just go through this quickly without undue wasting of time. Um, so, you know, you have, uh, so Michelson Morley didn't have laser, but they have some source of light coming in, split it into two parts, combine it back, you can see the interference fringes like this picture here, right? We covered that. And so what Michelson and Morley thought they could do with this interferometer is they thought they could change, um, they could measure this change in speed of light. And there's an underlying theory behind it. So what some people were doing was they were introducing this uh, mysterious substance called luminiferous ether, whose sole purpose is to serve as a medium for light. Uh, this luminiferous meaning light carrying in Latin. Um, so in Latin? I'm pretty sure it's Latin, not Greek. Um, so uh, what Michelson and Morley were trying to measure is they were trying to measure the ether drift, or how fast is Earth moving through ether. So, um, so let's say, just to, as a matter of labeling things, let's say ether is drifting this direction. So this is the direction of, I don't know, ether wind that uh, how fast this mysterious medium for light is moving. And uh, for all these people who didn't believe in Maxwell, um, you'd say the Maxwell's laws hold correct in the reference frame where ether is at rest. So speed of light is C. If in the reference frame, this ether is stationary. So if ether is moving in one direction with some speed of V, then they would say, oh, then in this reference frame, speed of light is faster going that way, and it's slower coming back. It, you can almost think of this like a current. Um, so you have a boat that has a, I don't know, water speed of 50 meters, that's why, 20 meters per second, and if it's moving against the current that from the shore, it'll look slower, and if it's moving with the current, it'll be faster from the shore. That it's the that basic idea. So uh, in the simplified of the Michelson moral experiment, you would imagine it this way. In your lab frame, you have one light beam that's being sent this way. You have light beam that's sent up, bounces against a mirror, and then comes back. And you have another light that's uh, sent this way, bounces against the mirror, and then comes back. Okay? And now what you have to, um, so I guess for this direction, it's kind of um, easy to imagine what would be going on if this whole ether idea was correct. You would say going that way, speed of light increases. So going this way, light moves at a speed of C plus V. And then coming back, the light wave is moving against the current. So it's a C minus V coming back. Yeah. And this direction is actually a little bit more tricky. Um, so imagine this way. So it, you are going from, um, if the light was actually aimed directly at this mirror, would it actually reach the mirror given this presence of ether wind? So how should it be directed? 
should actually be directed at an angle this way, right? So let's say, you know, that's how we directed the light. So the actual direction of light, it, um, it kind of goes this way. So, and then, um, and then it strikes it, and then it comes, so, so, I mean, so, you know, so for a one-way trip, this is the actual distance being traveled. Instead of, so if this apparatus has the arm length of D, let's say they both have the same arm length of D on both sides, then um, on this arm, you would say that the distance traveled is 2D. One way that way, and then back. On this side, distance traveled, you have to be a little bit more careful. You are not traveling 2D because it's actually working against the current, so you, it has to use a component of velocity against the current. Yeah? So we can actually uh, drive a quick formula and do a quick estimate to see that uh, Michelson and Morley should have been able to see this ether wind. Um, so this is an example of a null experiment where experimentalists actually saw nothing. So you would think, doesn't that mean they failed? Like, this happens a lot in actually other fields, like in psychology. Um, people hypothesize some effect, you do an experiment, you see nothing, and that doesn't get published because no one's surprised by the fact that nothing happened. <laughs> so, um, but sometimes there's such a um, heavy expectation for finding something the fact that you found nothing actually becomes a surprising fact that you have to try to explain in your theory. So uh, let's, uh, um, let's see. I think the way I can do the calculation is, let's do it in terms of the uh, time difference. And, um, I, and when I plug in the numbers, I will compare the time difference with some, uh, with let's say frequency of light because that's going to give you, um, that's going to give you when you are going to get one fringe of difference, right? So um, I will plug in the numbers in later, but I want to just drive a few formulas first that I need to plug in numbers to. So the two formulas I want to drive is the, the round trip time for this arm and the round trip time for this arm and the difference between them. So if uh, velocity is zero, those two round trips times should be the same. But when they're not, they're different, so okay. So let me call this uh, arm two, this arm one. So I think a round trip time for this is easier, so let me do that first. So round trip time T2 is time that takes to get there. So that's D divided, by, so you know, uh, speed is uh, length by time, so time is length by speed, right? So distance divided by C plus V, um, and the, the trick coming back, plus distance divided by C minus V. <laughs> okay, so, um, so, so that direction of ether wind means uh, this apparatus is moving this way, so going that way, it should take shorter because this is moving towards the light source. And going back should be take longer because the target is moving away. Okay, good. So you have this, a fairly simple expression. <laughs> and since it's so simple, let me simplify it a little bit. I can actually combine these two fractions. So, you know, factor out D and combine the two fractions. So it's a D times um, product of the bottom. Does everyone recognize these two products as being C squared minus V squared? Yes, good. Okay, and on the top, it's a C minus V plus C plus V. C minus V plus C plus V. So V's cancel, nice. So I have two C divided by all of this. So let me actually write that out. Uh, that's going to be, and then factor out C. Factor out C. Um, let me write it out this way. It's going to be, um, two times d over c times one over one minus v squared over c squared. Is this correct coming from here? 
I've done a couple extra algebra for some reason. Good. Well, multiply top and bottom by C, then you should get you know, C divided by C squared minus V squared, which is what this is uh, with this two. Good. All right, so that's uh, my T2. Um, let's compare this against T1, time it takes to get there and back. So there I have to know a little bit of, um, let's see. So I have to know this distance, which is not given to me. Mm, but, well, so this distance I could express it as V times T1 divided by 2. That's how long it takes to get there. This is uh, the distance traveled in that much time. All right. Um, OK, then I think I know this distance, right? It's a Pythagorean theorem, right triangle. Uh, this distance is still D. So this distance that the, the light is traveling in, time of, so this travel happens, um, so when this happens here, here time is T1 divided by two, half the amount of time of um, the whole full round trip, and coming back it would say, take the same amount of time, right? Okay, so let's, uh, uh, let's calculate for this time. So I can say this um, T1, over, uh, let me put it this way. Yeah, yeah. So T1 over 2, amount of time it takes, is the distance, which would be um, square root of d squared plus v times t1 squared, v squared t1 squared over 4 square rooted, divided by the speed. Um, it's moving at speed c. So, let's see. All right. Um, so this is where, hopefully, if you are observing carefully, you would realize that I'm not done. Uh, I have to do a little bit of algebra because I have t1 here and here. I want to solve the entirely in terms of t1, in terms of everything else. So I have to do that bit of algebra. So let's just go through and do it. It's not that long of an algebra. Um, so square both sides. Then you get T1 squared over 4 is equal to 1 over C squared times this, no longer square root it, D squared plus V T1 squared over 4 still. Good. Um, let me collect the like terms of T1 then you end up with uh, 1 over 4. Or let me factor out t1 squared over 4. So t1 squared over 4 times 1 minus 1 over c squared times v squared. So minus v squared over c squared. Good. That's uh, this thing moved over. And the rest are d squared over c squared. Yeah. So move this over to here, take the square root, uh, move the 4 over also. Then you get this result for T2, which is remarkably close to this. Uh, T1, sorry. Um, you get this for T1. T1 is equal to um, 2 times D over C, 2 D over C times. And the only difference from this is instead of just being this, uh, 1 over 1 minus v squared over c squared, you have to take the square root of it. So there's a power of 1 half here. That's the only difference between, um, oops, label 2 here, between uh, t, uh, this is t2, between t2 and t1. So let's just plug in some numbers. Uh, I want to just plug in some reasonable numbers and see if this kind of experiment can be done to see an interference pattern. Um, 
So we are talking about remarkably short amount of time, like nanoseconds. So, but I think you will actually see something. So let's try that. Uh, let me use Wolfram Alpha because that'll uh, make me not deal with um, units. So, so uh, which one is longer? Is T2 longer or T1 longer? I think T2 is longer. Yeah, so let me do T2 minus T1. So algebraically, that will be 2 times D divided by C times, um, so 1 over 1 minus V squared over C squared minus square root of 1 over 1 minus V squared over C squared. Okay. I'm going to use a bit of Wolfram language to plug in numbers. There's a syntax called substitution. I'm going to put, um, what should I put in? Uh, what's a reasonable length for uh, Michelson interferometer? Two meters? So let's say a meter. I'm just doing order of magnitude calculation. One meter. Um, um, C, hopefully, it gets it that C is the speed of light. If we, what is a reasonable speed for experiments like this? What do you think Michelson and Morley used for speed of ether wind? Or, so now they were rotating something. They were actually rotating the apparatus. So they would set this up, and then they would rotate it by 90 degrees. Like what would they be doing? It's not rotate, um, it does have something to do with Earth, but it's not the spin of the Earth, it's something else. Orbital speed, yeah, rotation around the sun. It, that's actually pretty high, let's just look that up. Orbital speed of Earth. So, you know, that's just some reference number to start out with. Uh, 108, uh, uh, let's see, is that in meters per second somewhere? No, okay. Wait, 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 wait. Uh, okay, up, wait. Okay, 30 kilometers per second or 30,000 meters per second. Let me put that in. Um, so V would be 30,000 meters per second. So it's actually pretty high. Um, I think that's everything, right? Let's see what we get. So when you put those numbers in, No, um, so the idea is that, so with the interference, the pattern you get, it doesn't really tell you anything. It's the change in pattern you are looking for. So you set up this apparatus, having it arranged this way, seeing some kind of interference, and as you rotate it, you are looking for that shift in the interference fringes. Good? Yeah, yeah, so, but the V that you are using for reference is the speed of Earth around the sun, assuming the ether is stationary around the sun and all that stuff. All right, so let's see, did they? Okay, they're not putting in a number for C. Let me do a number for C. Um, C is uh, about three times 10 to the, oops, three times 10 to the eight meters per second. Once again, I'm still using Wolfram language. Um, okay, three times 10 to the eight. All right, so it gets, did I do something wrong? Oh, correct the formula. So one meter, 30,000 meters per second. Um, all right, for, for the time, we get 10 something, 10 to the minus 17 seconds. Hmm, that doesn't sound like a lot of time. In fact, that sounds awfully short. Let me uh, try converting it to wavelength because wavelength is what I have intuition for. So um, it was three times 10 to the minus 17 seconds, right? So wavelength would be, uh, so wavelength is speed of light divided by frequency or speed of light times the period. So um, speed of light is three times 10 to the eight meters per second. And for the time, I'm putting it three times 10 to the minus 17 seconds. Let's see what that gives us. Wait, oh, uh, wait, see time, oh, wait, oh, sorry. I made a little boo-boo with the syntax. 
that's it. Um, so about, uh, I should have done this number ahead of time, nine nanometers. Is that comparable to the wavelength of light? It's getting close, right? So we started out with saying d is equal to one meter. Well, I can go from one to 10 meters pretty easily. I can fold this up. And in fact, that's what Michelson and Morley did. So when unfolded, the d would work out to be something like, a, um, something like a 10 meters instead of one meter. So that's one. And so it becomes 10 to minus 16 seconds. So you are already dealing with then, uh, so now this would be, uh, so this is about, uh, um, um, let me say, in nanometers. So 90 nanometers, that's about a fifth of the wavelength of visible light. So, what? I don't know. Well, let me just leave it here. <laughs> Without converting it to nanometers explicitly. Uh, oh, okay, 90 nanometer. So that's about a fifth of the visible wavelength of light. So they weren't quite expecting to see one full cycle. But if the, if, this is what I want you to imagine. If you had this interference pattern, and if this pattern shifted by a fifth of a whole cycle, would you be able to see that with a careful observation? Yeah, you would be able to see this edge moving out to a little bit, right? So there's a lot of careful experimental work to be done. But even just checking it visually, no, you know, no electronic measuring devices. Michelson and Morley had enough sensitivity to be able to see this ether wind coming from orbit of Earth around the sun. And when they did it, they got nothing. And in fact, they were able to put a limit on how fast this V can be. I don't remember the number right now. It was substantially smaller than Earth's orbit around the sun. So, so a lot of people uh, came up with the theories to explain this, um, explain this uh, null result where you know, you saw nothing. And one of those people is actually Lorentz. So let me uh, end up this, uh, or wrap up this particular segment here. So a guy called, uh, let me erase all this uh, algebra that we've done it, so we don't need to see it again. A guy called Lorentz came up with this idea. Um, so, he came up with the, the idea um, that we now call Lorentz contraction. And dilation. So the idea he had was maybe as these objects move around the ether, they change their lengths. So as uh, you know, as ether wind, so as this moves this way, the ether wind changes the length of this arm so that this arm gets shorter. And when he was working it out, he also figured then um, also the the time has to somehow change. I don't forget the details. The, his uh, um, the conceptual understanding was flawed, but he came up with a mathematical transformation that could explain this null result, how this experimental setup would physically change so that when you do the calculation of these two times according after with those changes, you gave zero time difference. And we will come back to this later today while I'm getting observed. But um, this is the historical background I want you to be aware of as we go into uh, how Einstein approached this.